the year was 2007, and for Kim, my wife, and I, we were, well, we were facing the upcoming Christmas season, and we knew that we had to get all that perfect family Christmas photo. Why? Oh, well, we needed that perfect family Christmas card to be sent out to all of our friends and family. 2007, our oldest, Kira, was five, and Claire was 18 months, and well, parents, you know that getting that perfect family Christmas picture or any photo with young kids, that's a process. Well, Kim and I kind of put our plan into place in Las Vegas. There was this place called Town Square, and Town Square, every holiday season, they would erect a house. It was a Norman Rockwell house. I mean, it was beautiful outside and inside. I mean, you can just tell the precision in which they built and decorated this house, and it was a very popular place. So Kim and I, well, we just knew that we had to find a a day and a time where the line was as short as possible. Again, parents, if you've ever had young kids or you have young kids, you know the younger your kids, the shorter the line it must be. And so we found that day where we Well, we just knew the line would be a bit shorter, and we got our kids ready, and we headed to Town Square to get our perfect family Christmas photo. The line wasn't that bad that day, but it was a little longer, and finally, it was our time, and we entered into the house looking at Kira and Claire, and hey, you get to tell Santa what you want for Christmas, and we'll... Kiara jumped right on Santa's lap, and I love this picture because she's staring down. You can tell she's locked in on this gap in Santa's vest, and Santa's looking over to the right, and you might be wondering, why is he looking to the right? Well, who's missing? Yep, Claire. Claire, our 18-month-year-old, wanted nothing to do with Santa. I mean, just nothing. She was so excited before she got in the house, but we got in the house, and she was like, "Uh uh-uh, I don't want to go up there. And so me being dad, I was just snapping as many pictures as I could. Kim and my mom and my dad all were trying to convince Claire to, well, go sit on Santa's lap. In fact, we looked at my dad and said, hey, dad, Use your papa powers and uh, try to convince your granddaughter to sit on Santa's lap. And, well, Claire, again, staring at Santa, wants nothing to do with it. By this time, Kira had already gotten off Santa's lap. Santa's like, we got to move this thing on because there's a line of kids and parents outdoors. And so we didn't know what to do. But what we knew is we wanted to get that perfect family Christmas photo. So we, well, we came to our very last option. What's that? Yep, mom, Kim, you have to do something. And so, well, this is what Kim did. And again, I think about this picture. Kiara's face was, get me out of here. Santa was a consummate professional. He's just smiling away. Claire is screaming her heads off. And Kim has that mom smile. You know that mom smile? It's like, I'm smiling on the outside, but I have to figure a way how to get Claire to stop. Well, I know you might be wondering if we got our perfect family Christmas photo so that we could send out our perfect family Christmas cards. Well, this is what we did get, our 2007 Christmas card. I'm not sure uh, if that's a smile on Claire's face, but uh, it's something. And I think about that, right? We all have this image in our mind, don't we, when it comes to Christmas? We want that perfect Christmas moment. We want that perfect Christmas photo. We want that perfect Christmas memory. But here's what we all know. Life isn't that perfect, is it? I mean, it's just not. I mean, we get this image in our mind of what life should look like. But in all reality, it's just not. So as we step into this new series, Home for Christmas... Think about those moments. If you've ever been engaged before, I'm sure that engagement moment was perfect. But how stressful was the lead up to the wedding day? If you've ever been married before, think about the wedding day. I mean, that perfect moment. You have books filled with pictures. But marriage isn't about the wedding day, is it? Marriage is difficult. I've been married now 24 years and counting and Man, we've had so many ups and downs, twists and turns. If you've ever held your son or daughter for the very first time, you know that perfect moment. There's nothing like it. 
But parenting, it's not perfect. What I've discovered over the years is I know a lot less about how to actually be a dad than I ever thought I could. You see, we have this idea of what life should look like, but in all reality, we all know life isn't going to be, well, it's not going to be perfect. In this series, we're going to be looking at a couple, a husband and wife, that I'm sure when they got engaged, I'm sure when they said I do, that they had this image of how life was going to roll out for them, that, that perfect image of their family and what their family was going to look like, but what we're going to see over this well, over this few weeks that we have during the series, we're going to see it's not that perfect. As we step into the storyline today, there's going to be three stories that I want to highlight. Not only are these storylines part of their story, but just maybe, just maybe one or two or maybe all three of these storylines will be tethered to your story. Maybe you find yourself saying, yeah, yeah, I see this storyline or that storyline, or maybe all three of these storylines tethered into you. Before we, well, before we look at their story, there's something, an insight, a, a bit of context I think is really important for us all to be on the same page on. Because as this story starts, well, it's coming out of what scholars call a 400-year period of silence. You see, God was very active speaking to individuals and nations of people and through his prophets. The prophets were spokespeople of people for God. And so God had spent, you know, hundreds of years very active speaking and guiding and leading. And all of a sudden, he entered into this period of silence. In fact, the last prophet he spoke through was a guy named Malachi. And one of the last things God said through Malachi was this, that he goes, see, I will send the prophet Elijah. Now, out of all the prophets, Elijah, if he's not number one, he's tied for number one. I mean, Elijah was way up there on the important list when it came to the Jewish prophets. It was Elijah who went toe-to-toe with the evil and maniacal Jezebel. It was Elijah who went toe-to-toe and defeated the hundreds of prophets of Baal and Asherah. And it was Elijah that, well, didn't die a normal death. In fact, God took him up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And God said through Malachi, Through Malachi, again, the last prophet God spoke through, he said, hey, I I will send the prophet Elijah again. He's going to come back before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, that God's judgment is coming. And then God enters into this 400-year period of silence. So for the Jewish people, they were waiting for Elijah to come back. For the Jewish people, I mean, all they knew was God was speaking and speaking and speaking through prophets, and all of a sudden, Malachi was the last one and then silence. And I, I think about that. I wonder, you know, if they just thought to themselves, like, what is God going to do? When is God going to speak again? When God speaks again, what's he going to say? And when God starts moving and, and leading, like, visibly. I mean, God was always moving and leading, just not in ways that they could see. I wonder if they just started to think in their mind, like, what's that going to look like? But what they could not prepare for, what they were not ready for, is not only what God was going to say, but what God was going to do. You see this 400 year period of silence. I think about it. And when we think about 400 years, I mean, let's just jump into a little bit of context personally. I mean, 400 years ago would have been the year 1621. In 1621, uh, the scientists came up with what's called Snell's Law, or another way is the law of refraction. That's when a light or a laser hits a, well, let's say like a plane of water, it refra- refracts. I mean, there's an important discovery. Uh, in 1621, a guy named William Penn was born. William Penn would eventually marry Margaret. Margaret and William would have a son. They would name that son. Yep, William. And guess what? That William, he founded Pennsylvania. And it was in 1621 that John Carver and his wife Mary survived the first winter on board of the Mayflower right off the the coast of Plymouth. Almost half of everyone on board had died that first winter, but for John and Mary, they survived. But in late spring, John passed away, and five, six w- weeks later, Mary passed away. I'm sure when they started out their voyage to this new land, they had a perfect image of what it was going to look like, and now they're both gone. And by that fall was the first, well, the first 
Thanksgiving. 400 years. Think about what has transformed here in the United States of America. For the Jewish people, 400 years. It's a long time. A lot had changed. A lot had happened. And Luke, who investigated the entire story of Jesus, I mean, interviewed eyewitness after eyewitness and actually came to faith to believe in Jesus, starts into this story about this couple, and he writes this one line. He goes, in the time of, of Herod, king of Judea. Now, this one line would have sent so many intense emotions running through the Jewish people. I mean, there was a love-hate relationship between the Jewish people and Herod the Great, and a whole lot more hate than love. The one thing Herod was known for on the good side was he was a prolific builder. He built the great fortress of Masada and, and Herodium, this, this hilltop fortress. He built Caesarea Maritima, I mean, the engineering architectural feat during that day and age to build that seaport was unthinkable. It was Herod the Great that built the Hippodrome. It was Herod the Great. One of his greatest building endeavors was to rebuild and restore and expand the temple. Now we have to understand the gravity and the importance of the temple for the Jewish religious faith. I mean, the temple was everything. The temple was a center of prayer. It was a center of, of sacrifices. It was a center of worship. I mean, the temple was everything for the Jewish people of faith. And it was Solomon, King David's son, who built the temple for the very first time. And to read the, the description of what Solomon built, the grandeur, the opulence, the beauty that he poured in the resources, the best resources in the known world into the temple. I mean, he set that bar so high. Why? Because he wanted a, a structure to honor God. And that's where that temple sat for hundreds of years until Babylon came in in 586 and completely destroyed the temple. I mean, devastated the Jewish people because how were they going to worship God? The temple's gone. How are they going to sacrifice to God for the atonement of their sin? Because the temple is gone. You can't sacrifice without the temple. I mean, this was devastating. But as world powers come and go, Babylonia, Babylon started to fade. And it was well, Cyrus the Great who came to power, defeated the Babylonians. It was Cyrus the Great that looked at the Jewish exiles that had been taken away from their homeland, taken away from Jerusalem, and encouraged them to go back. So they started to head back to home. And God spoke through two prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, and he, through both of those prophets, told Zerubbabel to start to rebuild the temple, the temple that Babylon had destroyed. As they started to rebuild it, uh, Ezra, there's this one line in the book of Ezra that talks about the, well, the Levites and the priests, the older people that had seen Solomon's temple in all of its grandeur and opulence. That, In fact, when they started to rebuild the temple the second time, they wept out loud because it was nothing like what Solomon had built. It was simpler and smaller and the grandeur and opulence was gone. They wept because it wasn't like it was. By 515, the second temple was, well, was rebuilt. And there it stood for about 350 years. But as world powers come and go, all of a sudden this this world power, the Seleucids, who, that gets anchored all the way back to Alexander the Great, is now the world power. And the Seleucid king at that point was Antiochus IV. And he makes this decision that, well, he outlaws the worship of Judaism. I mean, he just outlaws it. And not only does he outlaw it in 168, BC, by 167 BC, he actually sets up an altar to Zeus in the temple. And if it couldn't get any worse, he commanded they, they will sacrifice pigs. Pigs were the unclean animals, the deplorable animals. So now there's a t uh, an altar to Zeus in the temple, and they're 
sacrificing pigs. I mean, this completely outraged the Jewish people. And that launched into what's called the Maccabean Revolt. One family were so enraged that they were kind of engaged in guerrilla warfare. And Judas Maccabee, the hammer, led the charge and drove out Antiochus, the seclusive emperor, out of the land. They recaptured Jerusalem and, and the temple. And when they came back in the temple, they had, a, they had to clean it all out. And it had been so defiled, they tore down the, the altar to Zeus. And they got rid of all the pigs. And they had to clean everything to sanctify, to make it pure and holy so they could worship God. And when they came in, they found only one jar of oil that was used to light the lamps. It was one jar that was actually pure oil that a priest had purified. And what they realized was it was going to take eight days to get more oil. And this one little jar of oil could only stay, uh, uh, light the lamp for one night, but they needed more and they were going to have to wait eight nights. And as the story goes, they poured that one jug of oil in that one lamp and there was a miracle that that one jar that was only supposed to keep the lamp uh, lit for one night kept it lit for eight days. And from that came the celebration of Hanukkah, or like Josephus, Josephus calls it, the festival of lights. And through the Maccabean revolt came the Hasmonean dynasty, a family of priests that once again started to oversee and lead the Jewish people and the temple. Until, until 37 BC, Herod the Great, using his political savviness, got onto the side of Octavian, Augustus Caesar. And when Caesar came to power, he sent 30,000 Roman troops, 6,000 cavalry with Herod the Great. And Herod the Great came into Jerusalem and conquered Jerusalem and the temple for Rome. You see, Herod the Great, people despised him. He wasn't a Jew. He, he was from Edom. And Herod the Great knew that this was going to be the, an issue for all the Jewish people. So guess what Herod the Great does? He marries a Hasmonean princess, someone from this royal priestly line, thinking that that would help all the Jewish people to like him. But that didn't work at all. But beyond that, Herod the Great was evil and maniacal. He killed that wife off. He killed another wife off. He killed a couple of his sons. He killed his father-in-law. I mean, he killed a whole bunch of people. In fact, when he marched into Jerusalem, he took 46 of the leaders of the Sanhedrin and put them all to death and installed his own high priest. The Jewish people hated Herod the Great. And by 20 BC, Herod the Great had an idea to start to rebuild the temple. Not just back to what Solomon did, but beyond. The temple foundation he expanded so large that 24 football fields could fit within the temple foundation. To this day, it's the largest man-made foundation in the world. It took some 10,000 men, another 1,000 to 1,500 priests in this epic building process. And the famous historian Josephus, he writes this about, well, the grandeur, the opulence of the temple that King Herod the Great was building. Josephus writes, he goes, viewed from without the sanctuary, the temple had everything that could amaze either mind or eyes, overlaid all around with stout plates of gold. The first rays of the sun reflected so fierce a blaze of fire that those who endeavored to look at it were forced to turn away as if they had looked straight at the sun. To strangers, as they approached it, it seemed in the distance like a mountain covered with snow. For any part not covered with gold was dazzling white. I mean, Herod the Great, one of his greatest building achievements is expanding, rebuilding the temple. But it wasn't for the Jewish people. It was for him. It was for Rome. 
In fact, Herod the Great put a golden Roman eagle on the outside of the front main entrance into the temple, which just infuriated every Jew, God-fearing Jew. And by 70 AD, Rome came in and destroys the temple. You see, what we have to understand is when, when Luke writes this one statement, in the time of Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great, the king of Judea, people hated him, despised him. You see, I talked about these three storylines. The first storyline we, we got to hold on to is, was a story of political unrest. For the Jewish people, Herod the Great wasn't their king. For the Jewish people, King Herod wasn't even a Jew and definitely not from a priestly line. For the Jewish people, King Herod the Great was all about serving Rome, the evil occupiers. The political unrest which led to spiritual unrest was at an all-time high during this period of time. And here's the thing we all know, and this isn't a political statement. We're living in a time of political unrest, aren't we? Whether you lean left or lean right, No matter who you voted for, who you wish you hadn't voted for, who you wish would be president or not president, whatever you think about state and local government, it doesn't matter. Think about the amount of political unrest right now that we're living through. Have you lost a friend because you had different political perspectives? Is there tension within your family because someone or someone in your family has a different political perspective? perspective and it's just creating so much unrest so much tension here's the thing we all know we all are living in a time right now where the political unrest and political uh, tension is at an all-time high the same thing that was happening some 2,000 years ago and so Luke writes and in the time of Herod the Great there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also descendants of Aaron. And Luke very specifically, intentionally, adds all of this detail. Because Herod wasn't a Jew and didn't come from a priestly line, yet he was a king of the Jews. And Luke is saying, hey, by the way, Zechariah belonged to a priestly line. And oh, by the way, even his wife Elizabeth was from another priestly line, the priestly line of Aaron. It's like these two, both came from priestly lines. And then Luke gives us this insight into their character. Because both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Not perfect. But their heart was positioned to follow God. Their heart was positioned to lean into God. Their heart was positioned to keep their eyes locked in God. Their heart was positioned to follow God in their faith journey and also observing all the Lord's and commands and decrees blamelessly, without guilt. And this is such an important, important statement because Luke, again, is building this whole framework into the story. And Luke knows what comes next is really the tension point of their story. Luke tells us that they were both childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old, translated. At one point, they wanted a family and years and years and years and years clicked by and they couldn't have kids and now they were very old. A storyline that I'm sure they had a picture of what their family was going to look like. And now, decades had gone by and no kids. You see, this is a story of both personal sorrow and shame. Personal sorrow, well, because Elizabeth and Zachariah wanted to be mom and dad. Personal sorrow because they thought, When they got married, I'm sure they had this image of having one, two, a dozen kids. And all of a sudden they find themselves old. Never, never being able to have kids. Maybe that's part of your storyline. But it's also a story of personal shame. You see, during that time period, they believed that children were a blessing from God. And so if you couldn't have kids, 
Well, you did something to anger God. You did something to disappoint God. You did something to cause God not to bless you with kids. And there was a lot of shame attached to this, especially Elizabeth from a priestly line and Zechariah from a priestly line. But yet God didn't bless them with kids. So the public viewpoint, the public perspective was, hey, what did you guys do to tick off God? What did you do to disappoint God? What did you do to cause God not to bless you? What did you do? And maybe that's part of your story. You just, you really believe, or maybe someone has said to you, this is going on in your life because God is. And for Zachariah and Elizabeth, not only the sorrow, there was shame. And then, one day, Zachariah's division, there's 24 priestly divisions, 1,000 priests per division, 24,000 priests. And all of a sudden, one day, Zachariah's division was up. You see, your division had to serve within the temple twice a year on all the major feasts and holidays, uh, Passover, Pentecost, and the Festival of Tabernacles. And so this was a day for Zachariah's division to go serve in the temple. And he was serving as a priest before God. You see, part of this storyline was was a a story of public service. Think about Zachariah as an old man, thinking to himself that he did something to disappoint God, something to disrespect God, something to cause God not to bless him and his wife with kids. But every, every opportunity he had, he got up and he publicly served God. No matter what people's perspective was, no matter how much shame that the outside world looked in on him. He just got up and he served God and he served God and he served God and he served God. And on that day, it was his turn to just go in and serve God in the temple. And guess what he did? He served God. But on that day, everything would shift. And he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, this was the pinnacle of being a priest. That you would get selected, chosen, to go in and be the priest to burn the incense. Every priest knew that you could only do this once in your life. And, well, many, many priests never got selected. Remember, there were some 24,000 priests So you might never get selected. But on this day, Zechariah got selected. Something I'm sure as an old man he thought he would never be able to do. Something as an old man that he thought he would never get selected to do. And on top of that, well, God didn't bless him with kids. So why would God bless him with going into the temple and burning the incense? You see, I think about these three storylines. A story of Political unrest, a story of personal sorrow and shame, a story of public service. Do you find yourself in your story, in your messy, imperfect story, do you, do you find connection points there for you? Maybe one of these. Maybe it's all three of them. Maybe you find yourself just with so much political tension and rust within you, within your f- friends, within where you work, uh, you know, uh, online, with family members. I mean, just with the Christmas season upon us, and you're just thinking through, how am I going to make my way through that? Maybe for you, you're just in the season of great personal sorrow. I mean, you're just grieving inside. Maybe for you, shame's attached to it. Maybe it's something you've done that's caused the shame. Or maybe you just think God is disappointed with you. How could God love you? How could God... And you've just put that shame on yourself. And maybe for you, you're just tired. You keep serving God and you keep serving God and you keep serving God. And you're like, God, I just, I don't know. I'm just tired of serving. I'm tired of showing up. I'm tired of. 
And maybe you're looking at your life and it's just not rolling out like you think it should have. When you had the picture of what your life was going to look like, now it's looking different. But here's what I want you to hold on to. Because God was about, was about ready to do something within Zechariah and Elizabeth that they could never have imagined. God was about ready to do something through them change the world. God, even though there's 400 years of silence, hadn't stopped working and moving. And God was about ready (laughs) to crank it into fifth gear and move into motion his perfect plan. So maybe in your life you think there's something impossible. Remember that God always reveals That even in your impossible, everything is possible. And what you're going to see in part two is God do the impossible. Because God knows that everything is possible for him. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for a story, a messy story, an imperfect story of a husband and a wife that served you faithfully, even though their storyline didn't quite turn out like they thought it would. And Lord, I pray for every single person that maybe in their messy and perfect storyline that they'll just know that you are with them. And maybe, just maybe, whatever impossible that they're facing, that they'll just know with you everything, everything is possible. Lord, thank you for being a God that never leaves, never walks away. It's always with us, always guiding. And that your love is overwhelming. In your name I pray, amen.